Alright. Howdy, y'all. Welcome to week seven of our Bible study on first, second, and third John. Yeah. I hope you guys are doing well and hopefully we can all come back together pretty soon. Things are getting normaler ish, if you will. The gym's opening back up on May 15th, which means that I'll have to start paying for my gym membership again. <laughs> Not thrilled about that, but <laughs> I'm glad things are getting back to normal. Um, today we're just going to be finishing up uh, the book of 1 John, and we'll be reading verses 13 through 21, wrapping it up. And then next week we'll be going into 2 John. So if you want to go ahead and read over that book, it's only 13 verses, so it's not too much. Um, if you want to get a sneak peek of what's next week, I'm going to pray and we'll get started. Father God, I just thank you for this day and I just thank you for being good and rad and wonderful and amazing. Lord, I just thank you for the wonderful weather. Um, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is so good and I just thank you for everything that you have for us today and that you would open our hearts up to it, Lord. Um, and that you would just reveal yourself to us today, Lord. And in Jesus' name, amen. All right. 1 John chapter 5, verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Verse 14 says this is the confidence we had in approaching God. And that word confidence means all out, bold, freedom in speaking, without concealment, and assurance. And when we read this word, we have confidence in approaching God. So in the Old Testament, only high priests and prophets were allowed to you know, talk to God and have that communication with God. But Jesus bridged that gap for us so that we're able to have a relationship with him. And here in verse 14, it says, not only can we approach God, but we have, a conf we have confidence in approaching him. We have boldness. We have assurance. We have um, freedom when we talk to him. We can go all out. That means you can be hot mess if you need to be hot mess in the presence of God um, you can have assurance and then it goes on to say that if we ask anything according to his will he hears us so not only do we have confidence when we approach him but confidence that he hears us that whatever we bring to him whatever need we have he hears it and I want to give you a couple of um, verses that just go alongside of that because he says anything according to his will which is a key word there um, and I'll go into that in just a second but in 1 John chapter 3 verse 21 he says dear friends if our hearts do not condemn us we have confidence there's that word again before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. So um, a life that is characterized by obedience is someone who God hears. Um, someone who hear or who asks for things in his will, he hears them. And then another verse in John, big John, Gospel John. Uh, John 15, verses 7 and 8. It says, if you remain in me and my word remains in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. So there again, ask whatever you wish in my name. Those who remain in him, who his word is in them, can ask whatever in his name. So there's just three things um, right there that go along with each other. We can ask whatever we want from the Lord. 
fits within his will, um, if we remain in him and his word is in us, and if our life is obedient to him. I'm going to have you flip over to James. Chapter 4, verse 3. It says, When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So James shows us those who don't, um, you know, get things from the Lord. Those who ask with wrong motives. Those who are asking for things that feed their flesh or their own personal pleasures. So my question is, when you're in prayer, are you asking out of selfish motives? Are you not receiving something? Do you feel like you're abandoned? Because maybe you're asking out of a heart that's not, you know, lining up with the will of the God. If it's not lining up with the word. And then... I just also wanted to give you some encouragement as I was reading this because sometimes we ask for things from God and they're not, they are things that are within his will, but we just keep praying and praying and praying and we don't see anything happening. And I just wanted to encourage you with a couple of verses. Um, the first one is Matthew 7, 7. You wanted to flip over there. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be open. If you go down to verse 11, it says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who are in him? So in everything... Do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. So here we see Jesus saying, ask, seek, and you will find it. He is a good God, and we've been talking about how he is a good father and how we are his children. And he gives good things to those who love him, who he calls his own. And then another verse, um, and I'll just paraphrase it, it's in Luke 18. It's of the persistent widow. And... It's this lady who's asking uh, for justice and she just keeps coming and coming and coming and is just irritating this official. And he's like, fine, like, I'll just give you justice. Like, I'll listen to you. And Jesus says, this is how you should pray. You should be persistent in your prayers, not giving up. Keep going. So I just wanted to encourage you. Um, you know, maybe you are asking for something and been praying for something that lines up with the will of God, your heart is in a right place, you're asking with the right motives, but you just haven't received what you're asking for. And I wanted to encourage you with those verses um, to be persistent and to keep seeking and to keep knocking. And also just encourage you with be open to how God answers your prayers. We have such small minds and we think that we know everything sometimes and we think we know how God should answer our prayers, and God's fun, and God is greater than us, he's higher than us, he's mightier than us, and sometimes he'll answer prayers in ways that are unexpected, um, but still so great and still so good, because he's good. So I just wanted to encourage you um, with that. Verse 16. If anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I am not saying that he should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin and there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. And the one who was born of God keeps him safe and the evil one cannot harm him. So what is John saying here? He's saying, don't point fingers, don't gossip, don't be moral police, don't turn a blind eye. 
Um, don't place yourself higher than others because they're sinning. But what does he say to do instead? To pray for them. And that's something that's really hard sometimes because we don't like to pray for people who really bug us or I guess I should say it's not that we don't like praying for them but sometimes it's harder um, to pray for people when we feel like they may be too far gone and I know that's a mean thought um, but I've thought it I'll be honest you know they're just like really messed up but John says here to pray for them. Pray for those instead of immediately in our flesh go to judging them or pointing a finger or putting yourself higher than them to pray for them. And then he says in praying for them, it gives them life. Your prayer for someone, God gives them life through that. Um, my question is how much time do you spend interceding for others and let's go back to James uh, chapter 5 all right James chapter 5 verses 19 I keep flipping over it because it's such a small book <laughs> <All right. laughs> James chapter 5 Verse 19 and 20 it says, My brothers, if one of you should wander from the truth and someone should bring him back, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of sin. James right here is speaking of people who pray prayers of faith. And he says, If one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring him back. Remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and cover over a multitude of his sins. So whatever sin that a person is trapped in, God is great enough, his um, blood is good enough to cover over them, to bring them back. Look at people in the Bible, look at Paul. You know, he was killing Christians, but Jesus is so good and met him. Um, while he was on his way to kill Christians, hunting them down, and he changed his life. And Paul wrote over half of the New Testament, and he's considered one of the greatest apostles. You know, no one is too far gone. And James encourages us here to pray for them. Pray prayers of faith. Really mean it when you pray for someone's salvation. For them to turn from their evil ways because that covers over a multitude of sins and then James says God will give him life God hears it and you can even go back to verse 14 ask anything according to his will and he hears us and that includes the salvation of our friends of our family um, I love missions so I believe that goes along with people we've never met in other countries uh, Lord the Lord hears that and the Lord uses people or maybe he'll meet them the way that he met Paul I don't know that'd be cool be crazy but it'd be cool verse 18 says we know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin the one who was born of God keeps him safe and the evil one cannot harm him the word continue sorry not the word continue scratch that the word keep um, in the Greek means to alter carefully take care of and to guard to attend carefully. I was like, that's not right. I have really bad handwriting. <laughs> to attend carefully, take care, and to guard. So, he says God keeps him safe. God attends to us carefully. He takes care of us. He guards us. He keeps us safe from the evil one who cannot harm us. Will you go through hard times? Yes, but the Lord 
guards you. He keeps you safe. He is your protector. He won't let the enemy snatch you out of his hands. He's got you. Yo. He got you. I think of like a little kid in like their dad's arms and like God's got you. You're his like little kid. He's in your arms. He's gonna take care of you. I don't know. <laughs> so he's got you. Again. I said that four times. I want you to know that. To go back a little bit, we know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. And we covered that a few weeks ago. This just means someone who is living in God, living in the Word. He does not continue to habitually sin, to live in that sort of lifestyle. Verse 19. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. And I love how John really wraps up his book uh, with that statement. We are in him who is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life because if you remember I mentioned it every week so I hope you remember who John's audience is they are a church who has false um, witnesses who has false teachers who are teaching them that Jesus you know is an eternal life Jesus isn't who he says that he is and John's whole book has been no you're wrong this is who Jesus is. He really is fully human, fully God. Um, he is the final sacrifice. He is the anointed one and he is truth and he is life and he's light. And he finishes up, you are in the one who is true, who is Jesus. And you have eternal life. And that's so good. Verse 21. Dear children, keep yourself from idols. I I love this because it's almost as if John finishes his letter with, you have eternal life in Jesus. P.S. Stay away from idols. And it sounds kind of weird and off that John would just kind of throw that in there because we haven't talked about idols at all and during this whole book this hasn't been like one of his big themes something he's really expounded on and talked a lot about but he finished his, le his letter with stay away from idols so an idol is anything that <laughs> motivates you that rolls over you that um, is a master to you that you serve, that you put your trust in, that you even put your fear in. Something that rules and reigns your heart. And that can be something that you fear as well. And John's audience was worshiping a God that was not true because again, they believed only part of Jesus to be true. It was either you are fully God but not fully man or you are just man and there is no God in you. It's one or the other. So they were worshiping an idol in a sense. They were worshiping a God that wasn't a true God. Even if it was Jesus, it wasn't fully who Jesus was. It wasn't the truth of who he was. So they're worshiping a false God or an idol and they had a skewed idea of who Jesus was in this. And so my last question for you today, is there a false God that needs to be removed from your life? And this could be multiple things. Again, there's so much that this could hit on. It could hit on your work. It could hit on um, entertainment of some kind. It could hit on sports. Um, you know, there's so much that it, could hit, that it could hit on because 
It's anything that rules you, that motivates you, masters you, um, that you serve or that you put your trust in. And I mentioned that it's even something you fear. And I mentioned that because the word says that we should fear God. And so maybe there's something that you are, you're afraid of, or not afraid of necessarily, but that you fear. It could be, I don't know, an authority, I guess, that you have like a, a fear of that you put them higher on a pedestal and you look up to them and worship them. I don't know. There's so much that it could be. <laughs> Uh, but is there a false god that needs to be removed from your life? And I think that's something really important because I think it's easy to unintentionally at times put things above God if we're not careful and if we're not really paying attention. Um, I know that I love to work <laughs> and I can put work before God or I could put things like watching sports because I love sports and it's really killing me that there's no sports right now. I could put watching sports over having time with God over reading my Bible or having a time of worship or prayer. I could put watching a football game from like four years ago <laughs> on instead. You know, things like that, that we don't even think of that are really ruling our lives. And so I encourage you and challenge you to examine your heart. And is there an idol that you need to guard yourself from? So this is something that you already know. At one point in your life, you have put higher than it ought to be in your heart. And now you need to guard your heart from it so stay away from it be mindful of those things that drag you down or drag you away from the lord so, yeah. so to kind of go back over um those three questions that i had when you're in prayer what is your motive? Are you asking out of a selfish motive? And this goes back to verse 14 and 15 of asking of God. How much time do you spend interceding for others? And this goes along with verse, verses 16 through 18. And then is there a false God that you need to remove your remove from your life or an idol that you need to guard yourself from. And this goes along with verse 21. And those are my questions today. And yeah, that's what we have for First John. We did it, y'all. Made it through the first one and it was good. I hope that you learned something and I um, hope that the Lord revealed a lot to you and showed a lot to you and this was encouraging to you and challenging to you and I'd love to hear from you what God's been doing in your life through this study if there's anything that he's been speaking to you that you would like to share um, either uh, with me personally or you know with any of the ladies on our team we'd love to hear from you and connect with you and then next week we'll go into John chapter 2 not John chapter 2 Second John, <laughs> chapter one, because there's only one chapter. <laughs> We're going to be going into the second John. And I'll hopefully say it right next week. We'll see what happens. So yeah, I hope you enjoy your week, and it's awesome. And yeah, I'll pray, and we'll be good to go. <laughs> God, I thank you again for being uh, just so good and red and wonderful and amazing. Um, Lord, I thank you for your word. And Lord, I just pray um, encouragement over those who have been asking and asking and knocking, Lord, and being persistent, Lord. We read in your word today that you hear them, that you know their hearts, Lord, that you hear us. And anything that we ask in your name, Lord, you said we'll receive it, Lord, and I just pray. Pray that you would answer those prayers. Lord, I know that you see them. And I just pray that you would encourage them, Lord. 
And I pray that you would examine our hearts, God. If there's anything in our hearts that don't line up with your will or your word, God, I pray that you would remove it, whether it be an idle, um, false thinking, Lord. <clears throat> I pray that you would remove that. And I pray that you would burden our hearts, God, for those who are broken, who uh, um, aren't walking in your ways, instead of immediately in our flesh going to judging God. Let our hearts be broken for them. Let us love them. Let us want to see them come to you, God. Let us invest in them. Let us pray prayers of faith, believing that you again will hear us, but believing even more so that you are powerful enough and mighty enough to change a life that seems unchangeable, God, because you're so good. And I just thank you, Lord, and I just thank you for... Um, inspiring John to write this to the church and then for us today, God. I thank you for your word and love you, Lord. And in Jesus' name, yeah. I'll see y'all next week.